Okay, so we have a few questions on the platform. We'll start with a question for, perhaps I will direct this to the group MD. And the question is from Anonymous, and it says, what challenges do you foresee in expanding into the Francophone African regions, as your presentation highlighted, and how does Zenis plan to address them? So I'd like the group managing director and CEO, Dr. Adora Omelji Owen, to please uh, take this question. Thank you very much. I'd well, like you for that um, very interesting question. For us in Zenit Bank, um, in every challenge, we see opportunities. And for us, um, we see Francophone countries as a country with tremendous opportunities and um, is a growing GDP economy. And um, like we said earlier on in our presentation, we follow trade, we follow transactions, and we follow our customers, we follow the money. We realize that most of our customers have footprints in most of those African countries, and we are following them to those countries. And for us in Zenith Bank, we know and we are very, very careful about our choices of locations we go to. And remember that we still have opportunity to analyze the risk and the challenges before going to those countries. We know that typically going to a francophone country to register your footprint, that most important thing you're going to envisage as challenge there will be the language barrier and the cultural challenges. And for us, our strategy to mitigate this will be to actually ensure that we, for the language, we employ the indigenous. The indigenous are going to be able to help us. We are going in as a foreign um, bank, but by the time we employ indigenous, we become a local bank. And then for the culture, we have a culture of excellence as embedded in us by our visionary chairman, Dr. Jimovia. That culture of excellence that we carry everywhere we go, culture of discipline, culture of focus and culture of reinventing ourselves everywhere we go. We are going to take that same culture and replicate it in the environment wherever we go. And we are very confident that we are putting a lot of things in place, especially recently we signed an agreement with the um, Afri African Continental um, Trade, Free Trade Zone, that is Smart After. We signed trade agreement with them, and with that, we can leverage on it to be able to deepen relationship in most of those francophone countries. For us, we are not seeing any challenge, and before we make such bold step, we'd have calculated our challenges and our risk, and we are sure we are going to deliver more value to our shareholders as we expand to those countries. Thank you very much. Much Dr. Adora Almaji for, for that. There's another question here. This is more a macroeconomic question. Um, I think perhaps we can have uh, Edi Adamulawani take this question. How has the recent hikes in CR and MPR impacted the bank's business? That's the recent hikes in the cash reserve ratio and the monetary policy rate. These are policy measures by the CBN impacted the, the bank's business. Thank you. Good morning. You can hear me? Good morning. Uh, good morning, our founder and our chairman. Uh, good morning, all our stakeholders. And uh, like I thank you for that question. If I'm going to answer you one word, it has impacted us positively. Um, yes, the central bank will come out with policies from time to time. Uh, CRR increase is one of the monetary policy measures they adopted, you know, to um, term inflation and to control price stability. We see that achieve some level of result. However, it also came with some challenges. Uh, for the banking sector, not just Zenith Bank, uh, that has limited the availability of funds for you to lend to your customer. We've also seen increase in the cost of funds, which has also impacted in the cost of lending. As a bank, our focus remains the same. From the presentation we've seen this morning and from the commitment, the figures our CFO had announced to us, we can see that as a bank, historically, we don't see challenges. We don't see limitations. We see opportunities. Those policies, we see opportunities. We'll continue to take advantage of those opportunities to deliver 
excellent results. I would like to commit to all the stakeholders here that with the leadership of our group MDCEO, Dame Dr. Dora Meji, the support of the board led by our founder and our chairman, the man that invented modern banking, <laughs> with the support of the entire management and staff of Zenibank, Bank, who continue to deliver excellent results to our stakeholders, to our shareholders. The CFO announced the figures we achieved. That is just the beginning. In 2024, they had committed. And when he mentioned that figure, I had some of my colleagues who are business development team. They were saying, we'll do better than that. <laughs> Where I was seated, I heard them saying, we'll do better than that. And I can show our stakeholders that we'll do better than that. Or we'll continue to push, we'll continue to drive, we'll continue to deliver the results. So like I said, those policies are there, we'll comply. The chairman had told us, and one of these policies is founding policies that comply with regulations. We'll comply with those regulations, but we'll look at the opportunities available, we'll take advantage of them, and deliver premium and quality performance to our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Damulawani. Zenith Bank certainly in the business of seeing opportunities where there are challenges. We'll stay on the macroeconomic front now, and I'll direct the next question to our CFO, Dr. Mukta Adam. Uh, the question, well, I'll combine a couple of questions, actually. The question is around uh, how the bank is hedging against FX volatility, how is it impacting the bank's book, and what is our outlook for the exchange rate for 2024? Dr. Adam. Thank you very much, um, Relake, for the packed questions. Um, exchange rate conversation is a difficult conversation in Nigeria, especially in these times. Um, but... How is it impacting our book? How have we hedged um, our books? Yes, Zenith Bank, we have always have um, the foresight. We, we strategize. You would uh, realize that we do not deliberately place ourselves to benefit from exchange rate crisis. But as a bank, we have structured our balance sheets in such a way that when there is devaluation, it does not erode the value of our shareholders. That is extremely important to us. How do we see the exchange rate um, um, progress? We think that um, the in terms of volatility, we think or we believe that the worst is over. We um, close 2023 financial year with an um, exchange rate of about um, 951. Um, Naira's to a dollar. In the first quarter of 2024, we have seen exchange rate moving as high to as high as 1,800, 1,700. That was extremely high. But we have also seen the monetary policy authorities working round the clock to bring it down. At some point, it went as low as 1,200, 1,100. But in recent days, we have seen it trying to stabilize around 1,500. For us in banking business, um, and for everybody in Nigeria, stability is extremely important, irrespective of the level. Once it is stable, it allows you to plan. It allows everybody to plan and be able to execute your plan. So we have seen it hovering around 1,500, and we're using that as a guide to plan, to take the necessary precautions and hedge on our balance sheet, such that when it starts being volatile again, which we don't pray for, we will still not destroy shareholder value. But we think the navigation is almost over. We hope to see more stability, and that would also give us more stability in our balance sheet and our performance. So um, we are watching, be rest assured, um, the, 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 the volatility is not going to destroy the shareholder values of Zenet Bank shareholders. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muta Adam. There was a follow-up question around the outlook for the exchange rate. I don't know whether you wanted to comment on that or whether we should move uh, on. What was that? The outlook on the exchange rate. Outlook? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, um, hmm. I think I've, I've tried to explain that the Monetary Policy Authority is doing whatever they can do to ensure that we have an exchange rate 
that does not result in under pricing of the do of the naira we want our national currency the naira to be strong the monetary policy authority is working on that we have seen it stabilizing around 1500 naira we think it would hover around that rate more importantly for us is how stable it's going to be whatever rate is going to be let it be stable and we think it is going to stabilize around that 1500 and we are using that as a guide for our budget our projections and everything as we monitor the market okay thank you very much so stability is key okay so we have uh, a question around uh, oil and gas exposures and the question is how does the bank plan to manage oil and gas exposures i think we'll direct this to ed henry to help us uh, tackle yeah thank you Rodake, and good morning to you all again um yes the oil and gas is a very strategic sector in our economy where a big oil exporting country. Um, fact number one is that uh, the revenues for these operators are in USD. So that is a good thing. And uh, fact number two, given the size of this exposure, it is usually a syndication among the leading banks in the country. So we have common terms and what affects one affects the other. So um, the point is, how did we get here? The challenge we had had in this sector bordered on insecurity in the Niger, Niger data, high level of vandalization, and where you, are, where you produce, say, 50,000 barrels per day, and you, before you move the product to the vessel, you probably lose 70%, and you probably get 10 to 15 or 20,000 barrels into the vessel. No producer will work under those environments. What the government has done in the last uh, couple of years is to fix the security problems in the Niger Delta. And uh, because of the better security, we have seen an improvement in production, high level of improvement in production. So what the operators have done moving forward is improve badging to move products around. And the alternative evacuation route is also supporting operation in that area. Let me also say that the Petroleum Industry Act has also provided a high level of transparency. And under that act, they also introduced the Financial Technical Service Agreement, which meant that operators can invite investors to invest in these assets to generate output and all that. So what we have seen is that in the last couple of um, months, year, we've seen improved production. At the very bad times, we are doing about 900,000 barrels per day, but the country today, this year, has done as well as over 1.5 million barrels per day, currently in the region of 1.3 to 1.4 million barrels. But I said that to say that the future is very good, and we have also beginning to see from our books and in the books of the syndicate, syndicate banks, we are beginning to see increased liquidity and cash flows coming from the operators. So rather than see the oil and gas as a threat, I would rather see it as a great opportunity uh, not only for banks, but for a great country. And uh, we, we see, like I said, the cash flows are getting better. Some of these loans have been rescheduled by the syndicate banks, and they're beginning to perform. In the back of the issues we had in the sector, the central bank had given banks forbearance and all that. Those forbearance are still there. We believe that in the life of that forbearance, the banks will go through the challenges, and um, those loans will start performing better, and the performance of those loans, given the size of those loans, will also increase profitability for the bank and generate better value for shareholders. So for me, the outlook is positive and very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Henry Ora. So we have a question here on our retail and SME banking segment. I think that was one of the presentations that E.D. Akinogoranti did. So the the question is around the plans for scaling the retail and SME segment. The plans for sustaining? Sustaining and scaling the segment. Oh, yeah. great. Thank you very much. Uh, for us as a bank, um, and I think my presentation also covered extensively uh, what we plan to do with the retail. Uh, what we see in the retail segment of, 
of the market is that we have the opportunity to grow exponentially uh, in this sector. Uh, and why do I say so? We still have 37% of Nigerians that are unbanked. Uh, these are retail opportunities for us as an institution. Uh, even the existing customers that are currently being banked, uh, our digital platforms um, uh, that we're deploying, uh, we've seen it as a veritable tool to be able to woo a lot of retail customers to us. And over time, uh, one of the things that we've done, for example, with our mobile app, is that we've done a significant upgrade of that uh, app such that we have a lot of our customers who are really very excited and happy with us with respect to this product now. The retail customer is driven by experience. Customer experience is what really drives the retail customer. So with the various channels that we have put in place, uh, what we have seen is a significant growth in the number of our retail customers. And that has been responsible for the growth that we have recorded in the last five years, from 5 million customers to 33 million customers. We expect that within the next few years, we will probably be talking about uh, banking over 100 million customers uh, as a bank. And with, those, with that kind of customer base, uh, it can only get better for the bank in terms of profitability. Uh, these customers uh, benefit from our retail loan programs. They benefit from depositing um, um, their monies with the bank, which provides a veritable um, pool of funds that we can also use to create risk assets, even for the corporates that we are traditionally known to bank. And then again, I also talked earlier about the, uh, the SME business. The SME still remains the engine of growth for any economy. And that, for that reason, I mean, we as a bank have also keyed into the, the program of the federal government was an, announced by uh, Mr. President that we would like to grow the Nigerian economy to, a, to become a $1 trillion economy. How are we going to be able to achieve this if we do not support the retail, uh, the SME segment of the market? And that's one of the reasons why as a bank, we have uh, put structures in place to begin to equip our SME businesses uh, in terms of support, in terms of capacity building, in terms of funding. Uh, and so with this, as we continue to grow our SME uh, segment of the business, we believe that the country will be able to achieve ultimately the $1 trillion economy. Um, we also do have special programs for both the youths as well as uh, women. Uh, we have the Z Woman pro program, which encourages entrepreneurship uh, in women. So for us, uh, all we see are opportunities in this sector. Uh, whether it's retail, whether it's SME, uh, we believe that it's an opportunity for us to grow exponentially. And I have no doubt in my mind that that is what we will come back to you, our shareholders and investors, uh, as our scorecard and you will be able to get greater shareholder value from this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Akinogurachi. We've had a couple of questions here on the hold cost structure. One from Rita Anthony. What, what is the bank's plan for the hold cost structure? I would like to direct this question to our group managing director, Dr. Adora. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much again, Olake, for that question. And um, for us as Zenith Bank, we are very excited about the HOCO structure. HOCO structure is a structure that is going to avail us the opportunity to actually um, get into other business verticals. HOCO structure as it is now is going to give us opportunity to integrate our recently launched ZenPay platform, which is like a fintech arm of Zenith Bank, with the whole cost structure, we'll be able to integrate that into our business. So that whole cost structure creates a lot of opportunity for growth for us and for shareholders' value. We already started the process and um, we are waiting our approvals. And as soon as we get the necessary approval, we are going to embrace that structure and use it to drive value and use it to be able to 
grow the business and then ensure that we integrate other business verticals in our business processes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a few questions on fintech around how we're responding to emerging disruption to perceived competition from fintech companies. I'd like E.D. Lewis perhaps to, to take this one. Okay, thank you very much, um, Rodak, and good morning all. Um, thank you for that interesting question. Interesting in the sense that there have been conversations around fintechs um, competing with banks. But for us in Zenith, we don't see it that way. We see them as partners, as people we can collaborate with. Today, uh, most of the businesses of the fintech pass through the banks. We serve as settlement bank for most of the fintechs. So any value you unlock will pass through us. In 2023, South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria were the biggest fintech hubs in Africa and attracted the bulk of the equity investment off from offshore into Africa in that sector. It would be very bad strategy not to see the opportunities in that segment. Very huge. Another way to look at it is they are beginning to deepen the market in the financial services sector. All this opening up, all the potentials they are throwing up, are opportunities for value creation. And because we see the value in this, the issues of financial inclusion they are bringing on board. That is why, noting all these opportunities, we as a bank, we're also launching, like the group CEO said, our fintech retail arm, Zempe. And I can assure you, when we come there, that segment will feel our presence. So we'll keep working with them, we'll keep collaborating with them, because we see the bigger value that they're going to create for everybody in the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have a question around ESG. There are quite a few questions on the platform. There's even one on climate, so I guess that segues into ESG. And the question is, how does the bank incorporate ESG or environmental considerations into its operations and lending practices? I think, Dr. Adobe Wapa, you can take that one. Yes, thank you very much, Rolake, for that question. Uh, first of all, let me say that um, Zenith is very deliberate in going green. We have uh, an environmentally friendly brand. Uh, we're working towards uh, reducing uh, direct carbon um, uh, footprint and environmental impact by reducing greenhouse gas emission, uh, using cleaner uh, energy and uh, renewables. And uh, we're also using water responsibly. I mentioned that in my uh, presentation and then re reducing the amount of uh, waste you know, that we generate as a bank. Then for uh, ENS uh, policy, I mean, it requires that all significant projects, you know, get evaluated and they, uh, we monitor them periodically. Uh, the ENS uh, policy too is also embedded in our credit uh, policies to ensure compliance, you know, uh, on the agreed uh, set targets of um, um, ENS. So the review of uh, framework for funding and investment um, activities ensures uh, uh, that projects comply, comply, that's the word, with positive environmental and social practices, you know, at every uh, stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, we, we have a few questions on our capital raise, which seems to be the hot topic at the moment. So, I'm going to try and group two questions together. The first one is around the plans for the capital raise. Um, what plans do we have for the capital raise? And maybe the group MD can take that. And then after that, there's also a question on how the bank's uh, plans to retain its equity returns to shareholders post-capital raise. So maybe Dr. Mukta Adam, the group CFO, can take that question and the group GMD can uh, take the first question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, again, Rolake, um, for... Our audience that's asking us a lot of questions today. <laughs> Thank you very much. This capital raise question really takes me back to the memory lane. 
And um, talking about taking me back to the memory lane, we've survived several capitalization process. And um, for me, I cannot talk about capitalization without talking about our chairman and founder again, because we have various names for him. We call him the crystal ball man. <laughs> we call him the, the Nostradamus of our time. We call him the, 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 the godfather of modern banking. The reason why we give, gave him all these names is because he's been able to forecast the future for us. He's been able to look at the future and help us to plan better for the future. The last share capital that was raised by Zenith Bank, he made us raise more, way above what industry required. And that gave us an advantage in the industry today. Following the recent pronouncement of capital raised by Central Bank of Nigeria, if you look at the amount that Zenith Bank needs to raise today, we have the least compared to the banks of our pairs. And that is as a result of that vision that our chairman had to make us go ahead, budget ahead, prepare ahead of time. And today, we are going to look, and we are looking forward to raising 230 billion because we're already at 270 billion. And that makes it the least amount to be raised. So looking at our trajectory, looking at our track record, brand name, customer base, the numbers we have, the number of customers, the workforce we have, I normally call Zenith, Zenith workforce. I call them the unicorn workforce. They cannot be re replaced. They are very well trained. We've trained them with a lot of capabilities. And there's no assignment that you give them that they cannot deliver. So, <laughs> looking at raising 230 billion is peanuts for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's something that we can raise with a snap of fingers. Because as far as we are concerned, we have what it takes to be able to achieve that task. And then talking about Nigerian economy, we've talked about financial inclusion. We've talked about tremendous opportunities that are available in the economy. And with that, we'll be able to be able to raise that capital. And as it is now, we are coming to the market. We have done the necessary filings. We are waiting approvals of SEC and other regulatory bodies. As, as, as soon as we get those approvals, we we'll surely see our footprint in the market, and you will feel it, and we know that when we get there, you will know that Zenith has come. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Adora. Uh, Dr. Mutsa, the question around how Zenith Bank intends to maintain strong equity returns after the capital raise. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, yes, we've been discussing about capital raise. Today, Zenith Bank, um, share capital in issue is 31.2 billion units. Um, so let's round it up to 30, 32 billion units, for example. Um, if you go to the stock market, maybe for those that are checking the market prices, maybe the share price of Zenith Bank today is around 37 Naira. Um, 37 Naira. Let's even round it to say 30 Naira, roughly, for ease of estimation. Um, we, in our balance sheet today, we have share capital of 15 billion. We have share premium of two, um, 255 billion, making a total of 270 billion. So we have 230 billion more to meet the CBN minimum requirement. If we want to raise 230 billion and our share price is maybe 35, we want to give probably some discount to give right issue. We want to give some discount to encourage new shareholders. Assuming we want to issue it at, assuming we want to issue it at 30 Naira, for example, we will not issue more than 7.5, between 7.5 to 8 billion units. That's what we are going to issue. If you add that to our 32 billion units of shares, that gives you like, 
39 billion units. That is just like 25% increase in the number of shares, right? Based on my um, presentation earlier and the projections that we have for our profitability, our profit is going to grow by over 70%. So if the number of shares is growing by just 25%, and the profit is growing by about 70%, there is no way the return will be lower. With just additional 7.5 to 8 billion units of shares that we are doing, even if we had those extra shares as our last year, we could have easily paid the same dividend that we paid as our last year. So, <laughs> so raising additional share capital is not going to impede our ability to pay good dividends to our shareholders and even do more. It is also not going to reduce our return on equity in any way. So just be rest assured. Thank you very much. And I hope that satisfies. There were a few questions on the platform around rights issue, public offer, but I think that's been broadly covered. I think we have time just to take one more question. Um, maybe I'll direct this to Dr. Henry Oro. This is around the, um, the use of innovative technology to drive the business and tackle things like cybersecurity. So our, all our digital technology, how is it going to help us tackle and drive our business? Yeah, thank you, Lake. Um, we also know that as you are growing a business, as you are innovating to create um, solutions in the tech space, there are certain other people who are working on the other side <laughs> to work against you. So for us, as we grow the business, we're also providing protection for the customer. We're investing in firewalls, fire eye, various protection that is that is proactive so with the customer if you sign on on into our into any of our products before we deploy it to you we will have done extensive vulnerability checks very very extensive so you can be sure that whatever product of zenith you are using you are safe you are secured and in my earlier presentation i discussed the level of investment we have done to provide world-class technology to drive the business. In the last one year, thereabout, we have spent over a hundred million US dollars to improve our technology. And it's not only providing a robust solution, robust platform for you, that investment is also to provide a secure platform for the bank. And I, I dare say, there's no bank in Nigeria that has done that level of investment in the last one or two years. So for you, our team customers and stakeholders and shareholders, you are dealing with a bank that is like to, providing you tomorrow's banking today, that is providing you tomorrow's technology today. And this is a mantra. This is a platform that the chairman have built for us over the last decades. And this is the same platform that will drive the business forward. So the assurance is that our technology is the best in the market and will continue to be the best in the market. We will always evolve. As this is change, we evolve. If we have to make, us make that extra investment, we will do that to provide security and to provide convenience for, us, for, for, our, for our shareholders. And Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Henry Ora. And ladies and gentlemen, we're keen to get you out of here at 12, so we want to give room for some of the other items on the program. I want to offer the final words. Any closing remarks for the panel from our group, group GMD or CEO? Thank you very much um, for participating in today's program. Thank you very much. And for us in Zenit Bank, we'll continue to deliver on our promise. Remember that our mantra is people, technology, and service, and we'll continue to drive on those mantra to be able to deliver. We'll continue to be the best, and we'll continue to bring more value to our shareholders. Thank you very much for the confidence and for the trust, and we want to assure you we can only be better 
and things will even improve and even get better as time goes on. Thank you for your loyalty and your patronage and support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our ex-school.